with Ashlyn. So Ashlyn, I mentioned last week, graduated from Cornell University and is one of our fourth year students here at Sinai, um, who also uh, is completing a master's of clinical research uh, here at Sinai. She's won several awards for, um, for her research and published 17 papers over the course of medical school and uh, is also active in the section, which I don't think we can say uh, for every student uh, who comes through. Um, she's gonna be talking to us today about structural connectivity of DBS targets for Parkinson's disease, which is a project that she worked on with Dr. Capel. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, just sharing my sc screen quickly. You can see my PowerPoint? Yep. Great. Um, so thanks so much for having me and for the opportunity to present. Um, so like you mentioned, I'm going to be discussing structural connectivity of um, STN and GPI DBS for Parkinson's disease today. Um, and this is work that I'm doing with the Center for Advanced Circuit Therapeutics um, at Mount Sinai West. Um, so in terms of background, um, so as we all know, Parkinson's is a motor disease um, and first line therapy is really dopaminergic medications, but over time um, it becomes difficult for patients to remain in the on state um, and without dyskinesias. And so deep brain stimulation is one such solution that is um, really helpful for managing these patients. And it, um, can help them improve their quality of life while also reducing medication burden, um, especially in very advanced Parkinson's. So targeting for Parkinson's is typically based on gross structural anatomy and MR imaging, uh, both clinically as well as um, in the trials. And um, I'm sorry, one minute. Um, yeah, so evidence is increasingly suggesting, however, that clinical response is really due to um, modulation of the circuits themselves, um, rather than uh, just targeting those um, nuclei. And so we know, especially through um, work in other disease states, such as OCD, um, that um, targeting through the white matter connectivity is an effective way um, to really optimize treatment response for these patients. Um, and so really we have an opportunity here to optimize how we, do, how we target um, and to personalize outcomes for patients. Um, and so here, I just wanna show you an example um, of how this can be used clinically. So we have one patient that, um, was implanted in the STN and had pretty severe microlesional effect with dyskinesias, as we can see here on the left. Um, and so programming was actually adjusted um, to include the palate of fugal pathways. Um, and after that, we can see that her motor exam is greatly improved. Um, and typically in this case, um, it would have required reimplantation into the GPI. Um, but here we see that understanding the tractography and adjusting accordingly uh, was able to greatly help this patient's motor outcomes. And so when we think of connectivity, um, we know more about STN connectivity than GPI connectivity. Um, and so while we know that the STN is divided into motor associative and limbic regions, um, we also see a great deal of convergence between these regions um, in that you can really simulate tracks from all three of the regions um, in different areas. Um, and this has been shown in various tracer studies. And then we can also know about um, cerebellar connectivity. And so there's increasing evidence that the dentato thalamo cortical pathways are important for tremor response. Um, Although it's the number of studies that have been looking at this have been either preclinical or very small and haven't looked at clinical outcomes in these patients, uh, but that's becoming increasingly important. 
And of course, understanding basal ganglia connectivity is important. Um, and so we know that there's preservation of the circuits between the STN and globus pallidus. Um, and among patients receiving STN DBS, we can see that um, palatofugal pathway activation is associated with rigidity and tremor reduction, whereas nigrofugal pathway activation um, is associated with reduction in bradykinesia um, and reduction in dopaminergic medications. And while we know this, really less has been done in terms of the connectivity in the GPI um, and how that relates to other structures. And so really what we wanted to do here was to characterize structural connectivity in STN and GPI DBI patient, DBS patients and use this to better understand and optimize clinical outcomes. Um, and so that's really the big picture of what's going on. Um, and while many of the studies in the literature have either used normative connectome data or have not correlated um, connectivity outcomes with clinical outcomes, we're really hoping to improve our understanding of how these um, targets are connected to various circuits so that we can long-term use this to um, improve how we target. Um, and so what did we do here? So um, we used pre and post-operative imaging um, from the patients um, and co-registered to them in lead DBS, which um, is a MATLAB toolbox um, that can be used um, for uh, this imaging work. Um, we then normalize the images into MNI space, which is standard space um, that is important for comparing, MRI, uh, comparing the tractography between patients um, and between sites. Um, from there, we then generated the activation volumes um, from the DBS. So essentially um, here in this image, we see STN in orange and GPI in green. And we can see in red um, the actual activation volume that's based on the patient's own stimulation parameters. Um, and so this is essentially the electric field generated by the electrode. And from doing that, we can use each patient's activation volume as a seed to generate probabilistic tracks. Um, so as you all know, diffusion tensor imaging is relying on the diffusion of water molecules to estimate the trajectory of white matter tracks. Um, and so we are relying on this and performing a Monte Carlo simulation um, to look at the diffusion of water at each voxel in the brain. And so essentially what that means is we're doing an iterative process um, to look at the directionality of water movement and that um, and over uh, multiple iterations, it converges on what we believe to be the true directionality of the white matter tracks. Um, and we get a probability of um, of connectivity for each voxel of the brain with each voxel of the VTA. Um, and so as, in terms of clinical outcomes, we're using the uh, UPDRS scale part three, which is the motor um, uh, subset of the score. And we further divide this into the left, right, and axial. And so we can look at the HEMI score as it relates um, to um, each patient's activation volume we can really uh, look at the motor response. Um, that is the change with the stimulation itself, um, really accounting for um, the um, change with the stimulation and rather than the changes over time with disease progression and changes to medication regimen in this way. Um, so these are um, the results that we're um, finding and we're, this is a work in progress and we're continuing um, to update this uh, going forward. But um, essentially we have um, about 20 patients uh, with GPI stimulation and 20 patients with STN stimulation. Um, and importantly, they're pretty similar with respect to their clinical features at baseline. Um, so importantly with respect to disease progression and severity, they are pretty well matched, as well as in their response to medication, which is an important predictor of DBS response. Um, so we then generate, can generate activation volume average maps. It's basically showing us um, the location in which 
um, they have been stimulated and making a heat map of that area. And so we see that um, the average maps match the literature um, and what we would uh, predict um, for uh, stimulation. Next, we generate average maps um, by taking the quantitative data, the probabilities from each voxel um, of the brain and um, averaging them across um, all the patients with STN or GPI simulation. And so we see that um, as would be expected, we're seeing pretty strong involvement of um, M1 motor cortex. And while we know this in STN, of course, with the hyperdirect pathway, um, also interesting um, to see the same connectivity with GPI. Um, interestingly, we're also seeing the um, cerebellar connectivity, which is interesting given um, more recent work on the dentate thalamic track here. But while we have quantitative data for each voxel of the brain, this is just looking at it more globally. Um, we can also perform voxel-wise correlation, um, which basically um, correlates each voxel's connectivity with um, the motor outcome in these patients for their HEMI score on the UPDRS part three. And so here we see red um, are regions of positive correlation, whereas blue are regions with negative correlation. Um, and so again, um, as would be predicted, we're seeing motor regions as well as some cerebellar areas um, and potentially even some of the areas where we saw high connectivity are less important for um, the actual motor response. Um, and then just as a sample of what we can do to this quantitatively, although again, this is a work in progress. Um, so we can look at um, average connectivity values to certain regions that we generate with masks. Um, and we can compare that to UPDRS response. Um, and so both of these were slightly significant with an R squared around 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Um, and so we are seeing a slight trend towards increased connectivity. Um, but when we think about this, we want to think about um, capsular effects. And so that's something that we are currently troubleshooting. Um, especially given the patterns that we see in connectivity, whereas the STN has um, more frontal connectivity, whereas GPI has more um, occipital connectivity. And then lastly, we can also quantify this connectivity looking at GPI and STN um, and something that we're currently troubleshooting with this, especially um, in the basal ganglia areas is understanding how the proximity of um, the different endpoints, as well as the um, basically the directionality of the endpoints in relation to the um, STN and GPI affects this. And so that's something we're going to con continue to troubleshoot um, as just the limitation of doing probabilistic tractography in this way is that um, it's better for um, connectivity that goes um, straight up and down and across rather than. Um, some of the other directions. And so as far as next steps and what we're working on next, as I said, we're um, looking to account for capsular effects as well as um, for proximity. And um, we're hoping we can continue to do this in the coming weeks. Um, and then ultimately what we want to work on is uh, we can essentially run the tracks in the opposite direction. So if, we, if we're identifying certain areas that we think are important, by running those in the opposite direction and essentially looking for where we can best optimize um, targeting in the STN and GPI or programming. That's um, essentially the next step in understanding how we can um, use this. And so lastly, we'd like to thank everyone who's been involved with this project. It's been great to work um, on such a multidisciplinary group, um, as well as the department here and um, the uh, combined degree program that has provided support to me as well. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ashlyn. Does anyone have any questions if you're in the- Yeah, I, I have a question, Ashlyn. How, how did sure. you calculate the stimulation volumes 
or measure them? Sure. Um, so we use LeadDBS, which is a MATLAB program. And essentially what it does is we took the pre and post-operative imaging from the patient. So the CT scans um, post-operatively obviously have um, the locations of the leads, whereas the MRIs preoperatively obviously have more detailed anatomic information. And after merging those together um, and normalizing the, um, them into standard space, we use this program to um, generate the activation volumes. And so we use the patient's parameters from, um, uh, from their programming session um, and we, there's a mathematical formula, essentially it's built into the program, but from there it estimates um, the size um, of the uh, activation volume. And so by using that as a seed for tractography, we're essentially isolating the tracks that are going through that yeah, activation yeah, I, volume. I get that part, mm -hmm. but I was really wondering whether you're actually measuring anything or just calculating it based on prior models. Sounds like so you're just calculating it. It's calculated, but it's based on the patient's own stimulation parameters. So the voltage right. of their- um, But that's the input. You're, you're not actually measuring a volume, right? Like in thermography, you, you are, you're actually, in MR thermography, you're measuring the mm -hmm. temperature theoretically of a lesion. Not patient specific. That's right. It's based yeah. on data on a lot of different patients and, and biophysics. Yep on what you'd expect. And that's based on modeling, basically, right? I mean, it, at some point you could theoretically put another electrode into a brain, maybe a cadaver brain or something and measure and, and measure an electrical field. But uh, as I understand it now, you're not really measuring the electrical field yet. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Great work, thank you. Thank you. I had, I had a quick question. Oh, you can you can ask it, Kurt, and then we'll move on for time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just just in general, quick question about the use of the directional leads. Mm -hmm. um, did, I don't know if you've studied the the change in the mapping based on like how the the directional leads are programmed uh, versus the the standard leads. Um, any thoughts on that, or or what may change, if anything? Yeah. So some of the um, newer patients that we're including do have the directional leads. Um, really the main way that that's been incorporated into this is that it changes um, the, obviously the um, shape and size of the activation volume. Um, and so we are incorporating that into this project, but only to the extent that we're um, incorporating that when we generate their activation volumes and really only keeping to um, what they theoretically or ideally are being activated. Thanks. Great job with Thank the topic. Thank you very much, Ashley.